All right, so you have your exam on Wednesday. Uh, so today we are going to review for the exam in Lecture 12b. Before that point, we want to continue looking at the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups and its proofs. Symmetric and alternating groups and isomorphisms of groups, though I'm sure some of that will bleed into Lecture 12a. So last time we looked at proving the part of the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups that says that every subgroup of a cyclic group is itself cyclic. And in fact, we verified that if the order of A is some positive integer n, and if H is an arbitrary subgroup of that, then in fact, A is generated by A to the m, where m was the least positive integer such that A to the m was in H. Okay, we proved that that was the case. And we can also note that since the identity, which equals A to the n because the order of A is n, is in H because H is a subgroup, uh, that does mean the identity is also a power of a to the m, and therefore n is a multiple of m, and that will be a useful thing to note. Uh, you could also note, something else you could also note is that if m is the least positive integer, so that this is true, we know in general that uh, the order of a to the m, or the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by a to the m, we know from a previous theorem, is the order of the whole group divided by the GCD, in this case, of N and M. And since M divides N, and is a multiple of M, the GCD of N and M is going to be M. So you can also say that the order of A to the M is N over M. And that would be an integer because, again, we have verified that N is a multiple of M. What else do we need to prove? We need to prove, looking at the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups on page 81, that for each divisor of n, there's exactly one subgroup of that order. In fact, this cyclic subgroup, generated by a to the n over k power for a divisor k of n, is definitely going to have order n. Again, using the same theorem I just used here, theorem 4.2, you can certainly see that the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by a to the n over k is once again n divided by the GCD of n and whatever that power is. And this is an integer, n over k, because we're assuming k divides n. And it's smaller than that. Therefore, the GCD of these two things is going to be the smaller of the two, just like we said over here with, with m. m is smaller than n. And then do that simplification. This is definitely going to be a, a cyclic subgroup of order k, but is it the only one? And here's the argument that says it's the only one. Let H be any subgroup of the original group of order K. We, once again, from last time, we know that H equals A to the M, where M divides M. Look up here. And then again, since M divides M, M is going to be the GCD of N and M. So once more, we can use theorem 4.2. We can say that the order of A to the M, which is the order of this GCD, Again, m is less than n here, m divides n, is going to be n divided by that power. And once again, this GCD is going to be m. So what we have here is k equals n over m. You can solve that equation for m, the fact that k equals n over m here. Multiply both sides by m, then divide both sides by k. And you can get that m is n over k. And that does it. That verifies that h is this because m, right there, is also equal to n over k. So we can make that substitution. And that, we already knew, was a cyclic subgroup order k. Therefore, h has to be the same thing. Okay. I know that went kind of fast. Okay, If you weren't paying attention real well, you might want to, after class, look at it again. I think it is definitely worth looking at, the proof of this, and carefully thinking about it. Here's some classification facts. I've hinted at these things already. I could see, well, at least with a third of these, having you having it be on the exam. The first two are probably too easy. Any group of order one is cyclic. This is our first classification fact. You know you got a group that's got one element. That one element has to be the identity. That's cyclic. Every element is a power of the identity. Its Cayley table is trivial. 
Okay? So any group of order one is cyclic. The trivial group, the trivial subgroup of any group is cyclic. Any group of order two is also cyclic. Say G has order two, two elements of it, two distinct elements. I'm assuming A is not equal to the identity here, so that I really do have order two. How would you verify this is cyclic? You'd have to verify what about A squared? Get you back to the identity. Well, you could argue by contradiction. We want to show that A squared is the identity. Argue by contradiction. Assume to the contrary. That A squared is not the identity. What would it have to be then? It would have to equal A, because that's the only thing left. And a squared equals a. In other words, a times a equals a. And what would be the contradiction we get out of this? You would have to equal the identity. Yeah, which contradicts the fact that I assumed I had two elements. This would imply by, by cancellation. And it wouldn't matter whether you think of it as left cancellation or right cancellation. You get that A is E, and that's a contradiction. I mentioned when you get a contradiction, you draw a little star like this. OK, actually, it only looks like a star. It's actually two arrows pointing at each other. I always thought it was a star until somebody told me a long time after I was your age that no, it's two arrows pointing at each other. Contradiction. What about a uh, group of order three? It turns out it's any group of order three has to be cyclic too. Say G, G has order three. Where A is not the identity, B is not the identity, and A is distinct from B. Why would it have to be cyclic? Hmm. Seems like it could be proper. One thing you would hope you could show as part of at least verifying that it's cyclic <coughs> is, well, okay, what would be a generator? Would it be A or B to be a generator? It's kind of a trick question. Would A or B be a generator? That is a trick question. What's the trick? They both would be generators. I mean, it's got to be the case by the arbitrariness of the symbols. I'm using A and B. I could use C and D. I could use alpha and beta. I could switch around the roles of A and B. They both have to be generators. Any group of order, a cyclic group of order three, has to have two generators. Euler phi of three equals two. I could show that, for example, A generates G. Actually, you know. The identity is easily generated because you can just take the zero power. But it's kind of feels better if you can raise it to a higher power to get to the identity. In this case, it would be A cubed. Let's see, what, what would be a good thing to show first? It would be good to show maybe that B is equal to A squared. A squared equals B. Could we argue by contradiction there? Yeah? Assume to the contrary. That A squared is not equal to B. Then what would it have to equal? It would have to equal either A or E.
if it were equal to A, that's definitely a contradiction. Once again, cancellation would imply that A would be E, and that's a contradiction. So A can't, A squared can't equal A, but could it equal E? That's less clear. I thought about this ahead of time, and I had it down, but now I'm feeling confused. Let me try to make a possible candy table. I claim A squared has to equal B. What if it didn't? What if it equaled like E? Then by the fact that each element has to occur once in each row and each, each column, E would also have to equal B squared. And I, I am running into trouble. Because what would I put here and here? If I put A right there, then I'd have two A's in this row. If I put B right there, then I'd have two B's in this column. I'm running into trouble. This can't be the case. Um, I was thinking about this ahead of time, but now I'm just forgetting what I was thinking about. What is the contradiction of A squared equals B? Because in general, certainly uh, group elements can be their own persons. You think you see? Not sure? It's got to be related to the fact that there's only three elements. What is the contradiction on A squared equals B? Check my notes. If A squared equals E, so A is its own inverse, that would mean that B is not A's inverse. This is tricky. That's why I was feeling confused. If A squared is, is equal to E, A is its own inverse, which would mean B is not the inverse of A. That would mean, for example, that A times B is not equal to E. So A times B would have to either equal A or equal B, and that would be a contradiction. Either AB equals A or AB equals B. Left canceling this equation by A gives you B equals E, which is a contradiction. Left cancel, or right canceling that equation by B leaves you with, um, so left canceled by A there, right canceled by B leaves you with A equals E, that's also a contradiction. So either <coughs> assuming A squared equals A or A squared equals E leads to a contradiction. Therefore, A squared equals B. And the, an analogous argument would verify that B squared equals A. And yeah, technically speaking, you can use the fact that E is A to the zero power. There's one way of generating E. You should be able to do it with A cubed as well. I'm afraid if I try to do it, I'm going to run into confusion. Claim A cubed equals E. So once again, you could argue by contradiction. What if it equals A? Cancellation would mean A squared is equal to E, and we already know that can't be the case. What if it were equal to B? We already know A squared equals B, so this would say 
BA equals B, which would lead to A equaling to E, another, another contradiction. So A cubed would equal E, but as this is technically all you really need. So any group of order three is cyclic. How about groups of order four? You actually should know the answer already if you think about the examples we've done. Do groups of order four have to be cyclic? Some people shaking their head, and those people are correct. What's a group of order four we've looked at that's not cyclic? You want to say? U8. U8, yeah. U8 is one example of a group of order four that's not cyclic. Multiplication mod eight there, every element is its own inverse. So none of these elements can generate the whole group. The inverse of 3 is 3 because 3 squared is 9, mod 8 is 1. The inverse of 5 is itself because 5 squared is 25, mod 8 is 1. And the inverse of 7 is itself, 7 squared is 49, mod 8 is also 1. And that does mean you take higher and higher powers of 3, 5, and 7, you're still not going to get the other elements. 3, three cubed, for example is going to equal 3. 3 to the 4th is going to be 1. 3 to the 5th is 3, etc. That's going to be the case with 5 and 7 as well. Okay? But there are cyclic groups of order 4, like Z4. Or I think was it U10? I think was cyclic? Order 4? Okay. So, once you get to order 4, the group doesn't have to be cyclic. Dare we think about order five? Actually, order five turns out to be easy. It turns out groups of order five have to be cyclic. Hmm? How can that be? Groups of order four don't have to be cyclic, but a group of order five does have to be. It turns out, yes, that's, that's true. In fact, Groups up through order 5 have to be abelian, though we haven't proved that by any means. Groups of order 6 don't have to be cyclic. We've seen examples, D3, dihedral group, symmetries of an equilateral triangle. And S3 is isomorphic to D3. Those are not abelian, they can't be cyclic. Z6 is an example of a cyclic group of order 6. Order seven, it goes back to just one type, cyclic. Hmm, is there a pattern here? Z seven up to isomorphism is the only kind of group of order seven. Got a guess as to the pattern that I'm looking at? Two, three, five, seven. Groups of order prime have to be cyclic, it turns out. Groups of prime order. Any two groups, for example, of order three are isomorphic. Any two groups of order five are isomorphic. Any two groups of order seven, etc. I already mentioned last time that there is an isomorphism from Z sub n to any cyclic group generated by an element of order n. That would take an arbitrary element of Zn, call it k, and map it to a to the k. That's an isomorphism. Isomorphism turns it out to be an equivalence relation on the collection of all groups. So, from a practical standpoint, what that means is if you say any two gr any groups of order three are cyclic, that means any two groups of order three have to be isomorphic because they're both isomorphic to Z three. Yeah. 
GD1 is isomorphic to Z3, and G2 is isomorphic to Z3. And then the transitive property for the covalence relations implies that G1 and G2 are isomorphic. How would you verify that isomorphism is an equivalence relation? I'm not going to do it completely, but here's the idea. Any group is isomorphic to itself because the identity mapping, call it ID, from G to itself turns out to be an isomorphism. And that's an easy verification. It's one to one, on to, and operation preserving. Operation preserved pretty much by definition. If G is isomorphic or G1 is isomorphic to G2, why is G2 isomorphic to G1? Having I mean, isomorphism going from here to here says Zn is isomorphic to the cyclic subgroup, cyclic group generated by A. Why does it go the other way around, too? Is there an isomorphism going from here to here? And if so, what would it be? What's the only candidate you could possibly have in such a situation? In the abstract, say. What's the only possible candidate we could have there in an abstract situation like this? You know it. The inverse. The inverse, yeah. The inverse function. <clears throat> You'd have to verify that it's operation preserving. The fact that it's one to one and on to is trivial. <clears throat> this phi was one to one and on to. It definitely exists. On the one and on two, and it does turn out to be operation preserved. You'd have to verify that. And the transitive property does hold, like I mentioned over there. G1 is isomorphic to G2, so there would be an isomorphism from G1 to G2. G2 is isomorphic to G3, so there would be an isomorphism, call it psi, from G2 to G3. What do you think would be the isomorphism from G1 to G3? It's the only thing it could be. So it takes verification. Go ahead and say it loud. Psi. Yeah, psi phi, the composition. Work from right to left, do phi first, then psi. You'd have to verify that's one to one and on to, which you actually already know from chapter zero, and a new verification to verify that it's operation preserving. It's pretty easy. G and H are in G1. The fact that phi is operation preserving allows you to write this. And then the fact that psi is operation preserving allows you to write that equals this. And that essentially does it. If you want to be extra picky about that notation, you should initially write this. And then at the end, also write this. We don't have to be quite that picky about notation, though. Okay, it's pretty easy to verify, though it does technically take verification. So once again, to emphasize, that means any two groups, for example, of order three, are isomorphic, because they're both isomorphic to Z3. They're both cyclic of order 3.
that uh, subgroup lattice that I found online, I'm going to show you again here, for S4 is actually not a true subgroup lattice. It's not showing every subgroup of S4. It's only showing you what you might call the types of subgroups in S4. Now let's recall the number of elements of the various orders in S4. The possible orders are 1, 2, 3, and 4. Only the identity has order 1, as always. Do you remember how, how many elements there were of order 2? Elements of order 2 can occur in two different kinds of ways. How many elements of this form that are distinct would there be? Four times three divided by two, right? You got four choices for A, three choices for B, but you got to divide by two because if you Switch it around, it's the same permutation. 4 times 3 over 2 is 6. Of this form, you've got 4 choices for A, 3 choices for B. Again, divide by 2 to get 6 there. But once you pick A and B, the other one is determined if it's of this form. And also, <clears throat> um, you have to divide by 2 again because, for example, if you chose 1 and 3 here so that the next two are determined to be 2 and 4, that example would include the example where you started with 2 and 4 and then ended it with 1 and 3 because disjoint cycles commute. So there's actually three of those. Altogether, nine elements of order two. You can see down here, that would be nine cyclic subgroups of order two. You can see down here, there's only two cyclic subgroups of order two pictured. What do the colors mean? I'll get into that in a minute. So there, this is definitely not the full lattice diagram. Subgroup lattice, it's a subgroup lattice by type, you might say, types of subgroups. And actually these two are isomorphic even though they're colored differently. So it's not even quite exactly by type. How many uh, elements of order three? In S4, they would have to occur just as one three cycle Four choices there, three choices there, two choices there. What should I divide by two here? No, divide by three, because each of these things can be written in three different ways. Altogether giving you eight elements of order three, and that's the only way they can occur as, F, as three cycles in S3 at least, S4. Eight elements of order three generating four cyclic subgroups of order three. And in the visual here, uh, it would be this type right there. Not this one. This one. How about subgroups of order four? Cyclic subgroups of order four are going to be generated by elements of order four. which have to be four cycles in S4. And there are going to be six of them. Generating cyclic subgroups of order four that would have, have two generators each. Because order phi of four is equal to two. 
meaning there would be three cyclic subgroups in order four. Where are they visualized? Right there. The cycle is indicated by going around the diamond here. This is the type of cyclic subgroup word four. I think the C4 means cyclic subgroup four to four. And this, whoever made this diagram, it's their notation. Are there non-cyclic groups of order four? Non-cyclic subgroups of order four? It turns out, yes, there are. And they're visualized evidently in these two ways. Though it's going to turn out these two things would be isomorphic, though I'm not proving that. How would you create a, a non-cyclic subgroup of order four? Well, you can make a guess about how to do it by every one of the non-identity elements would have to have order two, if you think about it. Pick maybe alpha to be in this cycle, beta to be in this cycle. And there would have to be a third element of order two. I guess it would have to be alpha times beta if this is going to work. It's going to be closed. Is it really closed? If I compose these, do I get anything new? The answer is no. If you compose alpha with alpha beta, for example, do it abstractly, alpha squared is epsilon, the identity. You're going to get beta. Compose alpha beta with itself. Disjoint cycles do commute. I could switch around the beta and the alpha. I could write it like this, disjoint cycles commute, because I know these are disjoint cycles. That's why I picked these to be disjoint. I didn't pick it. Alpha's 1, 2. I did not want to pick 1, 3 for beta. And these are both the identity. You can also verify it by thinking about the cycles that this thing squared is the identity. It does turn out this would be one example of a cyclic, a non-cyclic cycle of order 4. Is there, are there uh, non-cyclic subgroups of, of higher order? Uh-huh. S4 has S3 as a subgroup, which has six elements. You can see that six elements in there. How would you create S3 as a subgroup? Well, I mean, if you're thinking about it in cycle notation, If I write down this element, for example, this could be thought of as either in S4 or in S3. You use the array notation, you're, you're not thinking of it one way or the other. But this element as a cycle could be conceptualized either as being in S4 or, in a, or S3. Now S3, as, as we've defined it, is technically not a subgroup of S4, as we've defined it because this is a functions, one-to-one -one and onto functions from a set with three elements to itself, and this is a set of one-to-one -one and onto functions with a set of four elements to itself. So why are they writing essentially S3 there as being like a subgroup of S4? They're saying there's an isomorphic copy of S3 in S4. In fact, more than one isomorphic copy. If I thought of this as being an element of S4, call it alpha, And I thought of this as being an element of S4, call it beta. Alpha and beta are going to generate an isomorphic copy <coughs> of S3 in S4. Another way to think of it is that if you're thinking of it in array notation, you could permute 1, 2, and 3 around, for example, like this, but always keep 4 fixed. Set of all permutations in S4 that keep 4 fixed would be isomorphic to S3. But 4 is arbitrary. I could also keep 3 fixed or 2 fixed or 1 fixed. There'd actually be 4 groups, 4 subgroups of S4 that are isomorphic to S3. A4 is the alternating group. It's got 4 factorial divided by 2, 12 elements in it. And I think what this schematic is indicating is that um, eight of these elements have order three. 
maybe three cycles like that. That is an even permutation. It's got order three though. The first power you get there, square it, you get there, cube it, you get back to the identity. Eight elements of order three, and three elements of order two. These three elements are part of A4. Evidently, there's a dihedral group of order eight, eight elements. That's a subgroup of S4 as well. Isomorphic to symmetries of the square. And in fact, you can figure out what that is by looking at the, at the book. We're going to take a quiz here in a minute. Looking at the book on page 95, they talk about how symmetries of a square can be thought of as a subgroup of set of permutations. A group of permutations. Instead of coloring the vertices, number them one through four. Okay, let's start this course.